So we are entering week seven this week, where we focus on the coming of Christianity and looking at how the Christian lens might situate within Southeast Asia and help us to see it as part of being a larger religious geography. Uh, so the photograph you see on the screen is really a reenactment ritual found in the Torres Strait. It's a chain of islands linking Southeast Asia to Australia. Though this is a contemporary reenactment, uh, it's an annual festival that celebrates the acceptance of Christianity by the local population. Uh, despite what you see on the screen here, which depicts a very violent encounter between a white person and uh, a, a, a local population. Uh, but I think what the image highlights in effect are the challenges we continue to face in making sense of Christianity as a culture and a legacy, uh, one that is often tinted through colonialism and the violence associated with it. But we're going to look for other ways in which to account for Christianity's presence across the Indo-Pacific, alongside acknowledging how this colonial violence was also a central part of the narrative and trying to work through this double bind. Uh, if previous weeks we have looked at the Sanskrit cosmopolis connecting Southeast Asia to South Asia, and then the encompassing and translation-centered Arabic cosmopolis that has brought Southeast Asia in conversation, not only with the Arab world, but also with Persia and the Islamic South Asia. Uh, this week, we will explore Christianity not only uh, solely as a European uh, faith, but in parallel with what was going on as Europe was undergoing a renaissance, where a new thinking sought to recover knowledge from Greek and Rome, recently discovered through archaeology, and have Greco-Roman taught dialogue with Christian faith. Uh, so outside of this European concern with this uh, conversation that resulted in the Renaissance, is also an emerging world of an Indo-Pacific Christianity in which Christianity itself began to dialogue with other religious cultures in the early modern period as it was uh, expanded across the world, uh, not only as a phenomena that was introduced by European traders. Uh, so to explore some of these, uh, let's look at the, uh, this particular church itself. It's called St. Mary's Orthodox Church, also known as the Royal Church or the Tomaya Kobil. Uh, so, by the word Kovil itself, uh, I think some of you would have gotten a sense that it's a word that is often associated with a Hindu temple. In fact, it's the Tamil word for a temple. And it's a church located in Tiruvi Tanamkode in Tamil Nadu, in India, uh, often believed to be one of the world's oldest existing church structure, although what you see on the screen clearly has been renovated. Uh, church records or legends attributed its beginning to the founding of the church by St. Thomas himself, one of the uh, uh, 12 apostles uh, or followers of Jesus Christ. Uh, and this was founded as early as 57 AD or after the death of Christ uh, itself. So when we look at the church time. Uh, timeline of the church history, the timeline of St. Thomas was rather distinct and outside of this development in Europe itself. And therefore, in thinking about uh, early Christianity and its manifestation in the, uh, no, part of the world, uh, uh, there are examples that also point to earlier forms of interaction outside of uh, uh, European introduction of the Christian faith into Southeast Asia. And these uh, most patently uh, express in uh, a number of distinct uh, features that we find in churches across the southern coastal lines of uh, South Asia. So the western coastal part is normally called the Malabar Coast while the eastern coastal part of South Asia is typically called the Coromandel Coast. Yeah. So in these areas, normally, though the architecture that have survived today would 
uh, very often be influenced by Portuguese church architecture with its distinct interpretation of the Romanesque style. And these can be seen in the squat, sturdy structure uh, that you see here on the screen with a very rather flat uh, facade that served as its entrance, uh, the main entrance. Nevertheless, there are also specific details uh, or cultural features uh, included within the church compound that spoke of a very distinct and unique expression of faith unique to India. And this includes the stum what is called the stamba, which is a type of uh, uh, a stand, right, uh, that can take the form of both the lamp stand, as you can see in the lower left corner, where the lamp stand itself uh, uh, is very uh, uh, that resembles a lot of uh, how it's being used in, for example, a Hindu temple or a kind of cross stand, uh, which uh, has the function of a commemorative stele. Uh, as well as the decorative use of the Parsi or Nasrani cross, or this is also known as the St. Thomas cross that are unique to India itself, uh, which is the sort of like equal arm uh, length cross that you see on the lower right there. Uh, so very often when we think of the churches that have uh, existed for a very long time pre-European contact, in South Asia, especially in the southern coast, uh, it very often contains its own pilgrimage ecology participated by peoples from all walks of life and from different faiths, just as Muslim shrines and Hindu temples were also sites of pilgrimages for Christians and Hindus and Muslims and all sorts of believers who subscribe to different religions. Uh, and so did the Christian churches participate active, participated actively within this ecology uh, of, of mutual visitation, let's call it. But to call it syncretistic or, or, or hybrid would only be speaking to really one dimension of the practice. For make no mistake, the, believer, the believers themselves are very well aware of the differences of these faiths, yet in different degrees, they participate rather autonomously against the teachings of this religion as described uh, by articles of faith and doctrines, really of demonstrating some kind of autonomy in choosing how they constitute their own religious ecology and cosmology. Right? Uh, so on the other side of Asia, there is uh, in China itself, it also was a home to a uh, its own uh, Christian community and very often uh, the result of uh, you know uh, many of these communities having uh, ran so far away from uh, its site of origin in the Middle East was often because of doctrinal differences and persecution. So the Nestorian Christians were one sect, one early Christian sect that did not always disagree, did not always agree with uh, the doctrines of uh, the main uh, uh, church, the church, early church fathers, and therefore were per often persecuted in some sense and, and had to sort of uh, propagate the religion or, or, or survive somewhere else. So an example of this is in the memorial of the propagation in China of the luminous religion from Da Qing. Uh, an abbreviated version is called the uh, Jing Jiao Bei, uh, which is a stele thought to have been buried sometime in 845 during the, the campaign of anti Buddhist persecution, which also affected the Christians. Uh, but what you see here in the stele is that the tortoise served to emphasize the goodness of the dead, and that it draws on Chinese religious iconography or cosmology. Uh, regarded in Chinese culture as an auspicious creature that symbolizes longevity, the tortoise would convey that a person was so virtuous that their spirit could almost live forever and therefore seen as powerful beings that could carry the burden of the world. Therefore, uh, one with holes that the giant tortoise, you know, uh, is, is one that supports the turtle on its back, right? And therefore, in this sense, it was also uh, repurposed.
and to serving as uh, a, a, a creature that could support the weight of the religion on its own back. So those were some of the early examples, but really the propagation of the Christian faith, uh, arguably, really began with um, the, 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 the announcement of the closed sea or the mare clausum, uh, which divided the world uh, into the Spanish half and the Portuguese half, uh, typically in Europe, uh, during the age of discovery in the 15th century. And this resulted in a Portuguese uh, thirst to uh, primarily seek and control and monopolize the trade route that would allow them to ship certain spices from the Moluccas all the way back to uh, Europe. And this led to the type of Malacca, which disrupted the existing balance ecology uh, sustained by faith uh, through very forceful means. And religion played a huge part in, uh, in, in translating and, and expressing uh, this vision of conquest. Uh, and often in Christian iconography during this period, you would find that saints uh, would be depicted as having uh, served as inspiration and imbuing the local troops uh, to, uh, to be battle ready, uh, such as this painting here where St. Francis Xavier uh, is uh, depicted as inspiring the Portuguese troop against the Archinese pirate uh, painted in the early 17th century. But the results of these confrontations are not always uh, starkly uh, devastating. Uh, it, what came out of it was a world that was restructured and reconstituted. And the Iberian world, meaning the Portuguese and Spanish world, really stretches across a uh, uh, huge expanse of the world, primarily also in the New World, which is uh, the conquest of America. And in America itself, of course, unique visual cultures develop uh, out of uh, that, uh, the, uh, their encounter with uh, the local Native American population over there. Uh, and one of the manifestations of the Iberian world was an increased obsession with this idea of the caste. And one manifestation of that was the Mexi what was called the Mexican casta painting, in which uh, uh, the population of an increasingly uh, mixed uh, society uh, needed to be understood and allegorized uh, in certain way. Uh, and part of this allegory uh, turns to this idea of thinking about what happens to uh, a society when different uh, population, different communities begin to marry one another. And this was imagined through the casta paintings. Uh, but casta paintings are not simple, simply description of the outcome of mixed marriages or what it would look like, but often depicts this as having dire social consequences. In fact, it was, a mer it was a symptom of the anxiety of the colonial ruling class of how people were really mixing together and trying to, dis to, to cast up painting, was using it as a moral lesson to try to discourage people from uh, uh, intermixing too much uh, and, 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 and really disrupting the, the social barriers that were imposed by ideas of race and class. Uh, so, uh, such as, for example, in the painting that you see up there, the surprise, uh, in painted in a, a rather late painting painted in the 19th century, which shows how uh, in a mixed marriage society, social order begins to dissolve uh, and, and chaos then uh, reign within such a society. A different manifestation emerged in the Malay world. Uh, so the casta painting was never something was something that was quite unique to Mexico itself. Uh, but a different manifestation, uh, uh, a related one, really emerged in the Malay world in the form of uh, Manuel Godinho Heredia's uh, very interesting 
visualization of his genealogy. So Iridia was an Eurasian born in Malacca, uh, uh, who would get his like, uh, you know, uh, priestly training in Goa, and will also learn painting and drawing there. Uh, and therefore, his uh, surviving records actually have very interesting visualization of, of uh, his place within uh, 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 the world that he was sort of like interacting in, in the Portuguese conquered Malacca. So he could essentially, if he was an Eurasian, that could trace his lineage to uh, uh, both royal houses in Europe and the Malay archipelago. So when you look at the 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 depiction of his genealogy here, you not only see a European heraldry, but also his imagination of what a Malay world heraldry could look like, uh, essentially uh, one that is decorated with also uh, Chawi script uh, at the center here. How true these genealogical uh, puppy papers are, really is a matter of debate, right? Uh, uh, suffice to say, however, uh, even in the process in which this was dreamed up and invented, uh, uh, Iridia was someone who was working within a social system that privileged one community over another. That meant that Iridia often had to project his Europeanness at the expense of suppressing a much more native and local identity, as much as he had to also acknowledge that he came from these two different stocks. Uh, one example of this was his repurposing and refashioning of uh, uh, quite a, a well-known uh, portrait of uh, Gerardus Mukata, who was the inventor of a mapping system. Uh, here we see Eredia fashioning himself after Mukata. Nevertheless, in this depiction, he would show himself holding on to a glove with his thumb resting not in Europe, but in the Malay archipelago, this appropriation, I think, speaks of the condition of the world where knowledge and people were gradually placed within a hierarchy uh, that saw Eredia himself turning increasingly to Europe in order to prove his worth and intelligence. But nevertheless, such notion of this hierarchy never became entirely totalizing. So slippages occurred and translation happening during this period yielded the examples of attempts at bridging cultural worlds that are at times very insightful and, and, and unexpected, uh, such as, for example, uh, the Luso Tamil Catechism, or, you know, uh, 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 um, catechisms are uh, a, a church teachings, uh, Catholic church teachings, uh, it was printed in Lisbon, uh, uh, actually sh suggesting the fact that uh, the authors were Tamil Christians who were living in Lisbon or Portugal at the time. Uh, it's bilingual work in Portuguese and Tamil, uh, with Portuguese and Tamil phrases printed in the Roman script. Uh, and these are attempts at really trying to sort of find a way to bridge different worlds. And this bridging happens concurrently in many different places, not only in European centre. An example of this shows two European centres uh, uh, participating in this active act of bridging and translation. But we find examples elsewhere, such as within the Mughal world and in Sri Lanka itself, Christianity being expressed in local idioms uh, using expressions, language, visual languages, and materials that are familiar to local craftsmen uh, uh, in the service of expressing Christian uh, articles of faith and iconography. Uh, in, and this sometimes uh, comes in the form of materials and iconography that are unique to very specific cultures, such as the weaving of Persian carpets in this uh, recreation of uh, baby Jesus and uh, Virgin Mary, uh, depiction of baby Jesus and Virgin Mary, as well as a very Chinese influence Ruyi cloud that you see here that serves as a support uh, for a, a wood, wood car, wooden carved uh, uh, crucifix uh, uh, 
that takes on rather confusion inflected uh, static of Vietnam, right? Uh, so in all these examples, it shows that an increasingly hybrid world was coming into being. And uh, in the next lecture, we will explore uh, a different side of uh, our translation, that of confrontation and conflict.